welcome to a brand new season of Campus Connection, Spring 2009. I'm Nicole Ramirez. And I'm Clay Murray. On today's show, we'll be discussing the recent car burglaries on campus, as well as issues involving domestic violence. Later in the show, we'll examine how students and faculty are dealing with the plummeting economy. We'll also discuss the new renovations here on campus. Also, we'll check out the men's basketball team in their hopes of qualifying for March Madness. But first, more cars on campus mean more burglaries. Ariel Yamin has more on the story. Earlier in the semester, two cars were burglarized in parking structure one, with a similar incident occurring that same day in parking lot 14. Though police reviewed footage captured by the university's security camera system, no suspects were caught on camera. In these particular instances, the time of the day, the cameras were not in a position to capture any of the images or the areas in which these offenses were reported. Though cameras were not able to capture footage of the burglaries, University Police has launched an investigation on campus and in surrounding areas. Parking enforcement officers have joined the investigation, trying to locate stolen permits. Once they're reported stolen, they're immediately listed as such within our, our database. And so when parking enforcement officers and police officers on campus are checking parking permits, that would immediately alert us when we have found a, a lost or stolen permit. If a lost or stolen permit is located on a vehicle, Parking and Transportation Services would boot the vehicle in order to immobilize it until the owner returns. Anyone caught with a stolen permit would then be required to pay a $250 fine. However, if a student's permit is stolen, there is no cost for a replacement permit, so long as they file a police report. The Customer Relations Center requires that they bring in a copy of the report, as well as their student ID, and once we see that, we'll verify that they have, at one, at one point in time, purchased a permit for the semester. And if we're uh, fulfilling all those obligations, we will just refund, we will give them a replacement permit free of charge. Despite the recent burglaries, Many students feel they have no reason to worry about leaving their cars on campus lots. I feel safe leaving my car here even though there were bur burglaries. I've gotten a few parking tickets, actually pretty much one a week since school started. So I know there's a lot of cops patrolling the parking structures. In order to avoid being a victim of burglary, Chief Skipper suggests that in addition to locking their cars, students should make sure no valuable items are visible within the vehicle. This is Ariel Yamin reporting for Campus Connection. Thank you, Ariel. I'll definitely be more careful next time I park on campus. Me too. The recent domestic violence incident involving pop stars Chris Brown and Rihanna is a hot topic. But many don't realize it happens on our campus. Frances Vega has more on the story. Health centers usually warn students against alcohol or walking alone at night. Dangerous relationships are not discussed as often. Experts say one in three teens report knowing someone who has been hit, punched, kicked, slapped, choked, or physically hurt by their partner. It's common. It's really common. And, there's, and it's, I think, more common than we realize because there's a lot of silence and secrecy. People don't, don't report, don't come forward. Researchers say young women between the ages of 16 to 24 are more likely than any other group to deal with violence in their relationships. Domestic violence experts say it can be hard for victims to realize they are even being abused. Even if a victim or a survivor um, has a hunch that they're in an abusive situation, they might also be getting lots of messages that says that he's just really passionate or you know, this abuse or control is a sign of how madly in love that person is. Relationship violence advocates say looking at the motivation behind abuse may help researchers find solutions. However, it is difficult for them to predict what causes violence. It, it's just so much more complicated and so much more nuanced and in, individualized. And yet, when you look at it, it seems like it's not that unique. Other reasons researchers have found are low self-esteem, stress, unemployment, and a sense of entitlement. If you tend to um, try to be someone you're not, and when you try to be someone you're not, you run the risk of acting violent because you're you're unsatisfied with yourself. Rihanna and Chris Brown have proven that abuse can happen to anyone. Those who need help can take advantage of this time of open dialogue. The Women's Resource Center has established Project SAFE to guide victims of relationship violence. Survivors can also make appointments with the school's counseling and psychological services. I'm Frances Vega reporting for Campus Connection. I'm glad to know we have local resources that help our students and community. 
And speaking of helping our community, we have Tiffany Ferrara of Foundation for Second Chances here to discuss the Children's Mentoring Program with reporter Jesse Sims. Thank you so much for being here today, Tiffany. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the mentoring program that you run? Foundation for Second Chances Mentorship Program matches adult volunteers from the LA area with at-risk youth from grades four to five. How long have you been working in nonprofit organizations and how does this one differ from the other ones? I've been a volunteer in the nonprofit sector for 12 years, employed for six years, uh, predominantly doing work in the mentorship field. And this organization differs from other agencies that I've seen. One, because we are truly grassroots. Um, what I mean by this is that all the way from the top of our agency, our executive director, down to the people who are our program directors or uh, program agents, we are involved with the parents, the youth. We know our volunteers intimately. We know our youth and our community intimately, and it is very hands-on. Additionally, most mentorship programs in the LA community are intervention programs that work with junior high and high school youth who are already struggling um, because they've made some decisions that are leading them down a negative life path. Our agency differs because we work with the elementary school youth in a means to prevent them from making negative life choices once they get into the junior high and high school years, which are really crucial and formative years. So our goal is to equip the kids before they get there so they won't need someone to intervene, but they're already empowered and fully capable to lead themselves on a path of success. How can Long Cal State Long Beach students get involved and what kind of mentors do you need? We actually have a volunteer uh, staff of people who are starting out in college all the way to the elderly. People can visit our website at www.ffsc.inc.org or the best way to get involved in the mentorship program is actually to email me. My email is tiffany at ffsc.inc.org. What kind of mentors do you need? Do you need males, females, Actually, all ages? Actually, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, the truth of the matter is in the volunteer sector in general, you have a lot of female volunteers but not a lot of male. And we have a huge, huge need for male volunteers. Out of 30, 30 mentors, we currently have four male mentors. And yet we have about 20 young boys who need men in their lives to be positive role models. Thank you so much for being here today, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. After the break, we'll take a look at how some students are financing an experience they won't forget. Stay tuned. More than one million Americans will be diagnosed with skin cancer this year. Skin cancer can be deadly, but most of it can be prevented. When you and your family are out in the sun, you need to slip on protective clothing, slap on a hat, and slop on the sunscreen. Skin cancer can affect anyone, no matter what skin you're in. Whether you're working or playing, remember to protect yourself. Welcome back to Campus Connection. With the economy on a downturn, Long Beach State students are trying to find ways to fund their education overseas. Katrina Watson has more on the story. Study abroad, office assistant. Study abroad trips are on the rise at Long Beach State. Each year, students take on the financial obligation to finance a trip. The Education Abroad Office has over hundreds of trips offered to students that can meet their budget. We just advise students on how they can finance what they want to do. So if they are receiving any financial aid already, federal, state, um, loans, they can use those monies to study abroad and we help them figure out you know, how they do that. Statistics show that less than 10% of U.S. college students actually study abroad. Everyone in your generation is going to be working in the global economy and needs to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. So I think students understand that going abroad is one of the ways to prepare themselves to live and work in the global economy. Students who plan on attending a summer trip might not have to stretch the American dollar in other countries. If you're going for a summer trip, uh, you cannot use financial aid. You can use financial aid if you're going for the whole semester or for the whole year. Students are able to apply for student loans and scholarships. Staff in the Education Abroad Office can assist students with finding more. I was lucky enough to have money saved from a prior scholarship that had nothing to do with study abroad. Uh, so that was kind of like my base fund. Um, and then on top of that, I got the scholarship from Cal State. And then other than that, I just put in the hours, six days a week, waitressing. 
Without the help of financial aid or scholarships, students still value what they gain from the trip. I think in the long run, the expenses I can pay back, but the experiences will, will always be there and there'll be something that I'll carry on throughout my life. If you're interested in the many ways on how to finance your own study abroad trip, you can visit the Education Abroad office in Broughtman Hall, Monday through Friday. This is Katrina Watson reporting for Campus Connection. Thank you, Katrina. That sounds like an amazing opportunity to travel and explore the world outside of our beach city. And with the economy as it is, the financial help is great. I know, I'm motivated. Here to speak about the current economy is Dr. Sage Steinmetz with reporter Lydia Hamm. Thank you, Dr. Steinmetz, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So currently we are going through a recession. Does it compare to the Great Depression? Well, as an economist, we have to look at the evidence. Uh, we have to consider key statistics that are often looked at. Uh, one would be unemployment, for instance. Now, we're currently at about an 8% unemployment rate. That we're 2.2% shorter in jobs than we were last year. Now, let's compare that to the beginning of the Great Depression, say in 1930, when job loss was about 5%, and in 1931, another 6.5%, and then 1932, another 7%. So on that front, we're, we're not quite, quite near where the depression was as far as employment goes. Uh, another key indicator is gross domestic product. Think of that as the value of everything we produce. Think of that as a reflection of what, what our income is. Now, uh, we actually had a rise in gross domestic product last year. This year, the Congressional Budget Office projects that we're going to lose about 2% in overall GDP. Now, in 1930, gross domestic product fell by about 9%. 1931 by about 8%, 1932 by another 13%. Again, it's very difficult at this point to make comparisons between a recession we're experiencing now, which is, although severe, numerically not a lot different than what we experienced in the early 80s. Meanwhile, in the Depression, you know, we, we talk about 25 to 30 bank failures. In the Depression, there were over 10,000 bank failures. Or we look at the stock market. Uh, we've lost about 40% of its peak value since a few years ago. During the Great Depression, the stock market lost nearly 90% of its value. So that, that's an economist's short way of saying uh, it's not quite a comparison yet. So did the recession surprise you or did it not surprise you? It, it absolutely surprised me. I, I lost 40% of my savings. Uh, economists are certainly not immune from this. And I think this brings up uh, a key point about what, what we see in the stock markets, the volatility we see now, is that it's not bad news about the economy that makes uh, stocks crash. What's, what creates this volatility is unexpected bad news. Right? Then there's uncertainty as to how to approach the information they're giving. Uh, it, the, well, the short answer is bad news is bad, but unexpected bad news is really bad, and everybody's surprised by it, and that's when you see things start to precipitate. So President Obama has been trying to raise our confidence in our economy. Does our confidence matter at all in our economy? Yes, uh, if you think about you know, getting back, for instance, to the stock market, if you think about why do we invest in companies, it's to provide funding for businesses to develop their products and to grow their businesses, to grow our economy as such, uh, to provide jobs. And if we're not confident in the investments we make, if we're not confident enough to place our capital in their hands, then that's going to stifle the growth that comes from these investments. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Steinmetz, for joining us today. Thank you. When we return to buzz on the new renovations that students can't seem to stop talking about, don't go away. The most dangerous thing our kids have to deal with today isn't violence. It isn't drugs. It's unhealthy food. Too many of our kids are overweight. They're headed for diabetes, heart problems, or worse. They need to eat healthy things like vegetables, fruits, high fiber vegetarian foods. As our kids grow, the right foods can help protect them from obesity, heart problems, diabetes, and even cancer. To find out more, call for a free booklet or visit our website, kidsgethealthy.org. Welcome back to the show. Good news for hungry students. The Campus Outpost restaurant has finally opened. Robert Guerra has more. Almost a full year after the first scheduled reopening date, the newly renovated Campus Outpost Grill and Convenience Store is back in business. When we originally planned, we wanted to be open a year ago, but that was very ambitious and probably too ambitious. We wanted to be open more realistically probably last fall. Um, the construction delays took us past that until this date. Penrod says that an overly expensive first design 
difficulty locating underground utilities, and a series of non-responsive general contractors were just a few of the snags in the $5.5 million renovation project. We planned for some of that, some of that we, we didn't plan for. We've managed accordingly to make sure that uh, we're you know, uh, doing what we need to do to manage our financial and economic conditions. Uh, times are a little hard now, but we're going to be okay and we're happy we're open now. During the months that the outpost was closed for renovations, students and faculty openly complained about having to hike to Upper Campus to buy their food and school supplies. In the past, I've had to go up to Upper Campus and get a bite to eat. And now that the outpost is open, it's very convenient since all my classes are in the PE building. Customers can buy everything from a single location while also being provided with both indoor and outdoor seating to study and socialize. And it's just nice to have places to sit down and just relax and enjoy yourself, take your time eating instead of just having to be in the rush. Coupled with the completion of the new parking structures in Lot 11 and the anticipated grand opening of the new rec center in 2010, campus officials believe outpost business will thrive as a result of the high volume of traffic in the area. This was always really our most popular location on the whole campus, so we expect it to go back to be a number one on the list. Reporting for Campus Connection, this is Robert Guerra. Looks like students enjoy having a place to eat at Lower Campus. Yeah, it sure does. I like their chili cheeseburgers myself. I might try it sometime. Yeah. Well, students can also look forward to the opening of another facility, only this one will help them stay in shape. Erica McClarty previews the Student Recreation and Wellness Center. Cal State Long Beach has finally started the construction of a $61 million student recreation and wellness center. The facility will offer fitness classes, eight basketball courts, an indoor track, and an Olympic-sized swimming pool. With the center, students will be encouraged to stay on campus longer. I think it's a great, great way for people to, who would normally just come and leave campus really quickly to come and stay and enjoy themselves on campus. In a time when jobs are scarce, those in need of employment can look to the new center for jobs and internships. This is one of the most exciting things, um, components of the Recreation Wellness Center because it's bringing 200 to 300 more student jobs right on campus. The center will hire CSULB students before hiring outside applicants. They need jobs and a lot of students are not being hired, not only because there's not enough jobs outside, but also because they're not graduated yet. So in campus or on campus job will be the greatest, greatest, greatest solution to this problem. Students can use the center to study, socialize, or just take a break. I think that with the rec center on campus, there's going to just be that atmosphere of where if a student wants to go and work out or just go somewhere and relax, they're going to be able to now. To get a sneak peek of the center, you can take a virtual tour online at ASI's home page. The 3D animation that feature that we'll have on our website once it's completed will have a virtual tour of the facility along with the voiceover and handicap uh, features so that people with visually hearing impaired can also watch the video. Students are looking forward to the completion of the Recreation and Wellness Center in the summer of 2010. Now you know what's over the green fence. This is Erica McClarity with Campus Connection. Thanks, Erica. One Long Beach State alum is making good use of the skills he learned here. Rob Frecker interviews John Canales. He's a former editor of the Daily 49er and is currently a reporter for the Press-Telegram. John, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Tell me about working for the Press-Telegram and what you enjoy most about your job. Well, um, I enjoy the variety of uh, the experiences I get to have. Um, one day I'll be handling, you know, an act of violence or something horrible like that. The next day I'll be doing a feature on a wonderful librarian. Um, and then after that it's on to politics. So I enjoy um, the fact that the job changes every day. Your executive ed editor, Rich Archibald, was recently on campus for mm -hmm. the Careers Day, and he said newspapers had the wrong business model. Do you agree with that? I think that the business model is changing. I think it was the right business model for the last hundred years, at least at the Press-Telegram, and now we have to find a way um, to make money off the Internet, and so that's the biggest challenge we face. Uh, the old business mo model is still paying our bills. Uh, we make 95% of our revenue from print still, and right now, so that leaves about 5% from online. And um, it's quite a challenge to sort of flip those numbers, but that's the direction we have to go in. What are some of the things that they're trying to put on the internet? 
Uh, well, we put um, all of our daily content, all of the print content goes online, and then there are also a lot of things that are exclusive to the website. Um, these days we can't fit as many stories as we'd like in print, so a lot of them end up running online only. There are also a lot of video features, um, photo galleries, um, a sublimited amount of database um, analysis and things like that from our area, crime stats, that sort of thing. UCI Dean Erwin Chimerinsky recently said that if newspapers fail, no one will bear witness. What does he mean by that? Uh, well, I think that he probably means that no one will be there to watch the government and or watch over the government and watch what it's doing and keep an eye on it. Um, and like I wouldn't be one to disagree with Erwin Chemerinsky, but um, I also think that the, there will be people who step in. I mean, there already are bloggers and lots of news organizations that are sort of keeping an eye on government again and bearing witness to history. Um, but I'm not sure if the depth will remain that you get um, from, from newspapers. Do you think there are any advantages or disadvantages of working in a Long Beach media market as opposed to LA or Orange County? Uh, well, there are a lot of advantages um, because we have a, a good sized city, um, about half a million people, and then the press telegram goes into neighboring cities uh, like Lakewood and Cerritos. And so we probably have a circulation, I mean, a, a population in, in the, our coverage area is probably over a million. Um, so you get a good size urban environment, but at the same time, you know, it's small enough that it's accessible and that you can get to stories quickly. Um, but we all are, are always going to be overshadowed by LA and Orange County, in a sense, because those are bigger markets. It seems as, as a recent uh, graduate of, of Long Beach State, you were one of the last to be able to seamlessly transition into a newspaper job here in Long Beach. <laughs> what do you think uh, the, is a prospect for future journalists? I think it's going to be challenging um, for journalists in print and broadcast in electronic media. Um, a lot of the organizations are shrinking, so you have to be aware of that reality. Um, and within Long Beach, um, it's pretty tough right now I have to say that nobody is really hiring as far as I know. But I think it will start to open up with the economy. So, John, thanks so much for spending some time here oh, with us. Thanks today. a lot. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. When we come back, we'll look at a place some consider the birthplace of the world, and it's right here on campus. He graduated from one of the best medical schools, walked into a built-in practice. As an Air Force flight surgeon, he's learned that not all battles are fought in the air. And to understand the stresses of high-speed flight, he has to experience them firsthand. So if you want to practice medicine in a more stimulating atmosphere, call 1-800-423-USAF. Welcome back to the show. Campus Connection reporter Nikki McVeigh looks into the history and future of the sacred Pavunga site on campus. The 22-acre site along Bellflower Boulevard may just appear to be an overgrown lot. However, to the people of the Gabrielino tribe, it is a site of significance. It is believed to be the birthplace of their lawgiver and God. It is also believed by some to be the place of the creation of the world. And the Pavunga were our creator, we ought to was the last of the creations, the first being the earth, the water, the rocks, the plants, the animals. He was the last of those creations. Beginning in the 1960s, the Gabrielino tribe has fought to preserve the land from potential development. The university first attempted to build a strip mall on the site. This was met with protests and a lawsuit being filed to halt any construction. The tribe contributes the success of their protest to 78-year-old Lillian Robles. Robles slept on the land for two weeks facing police, developers, campus officials, and bulldozers. The Gabrielinos value and respect elders such as Robles for all they have done. At the annual powwow event held on campus, Gabrielino elders were honored. Thank you. I'll tell you who fought harder for us to be here. It's our grandparents, it's our elders. They're the ones who have suffered for us. And they're here representing their elders, our relatives who are no longer with us, such as Lillian Robles. Currently, there are symbolic items on the site, including a cross and pole adorned with ribbons, beads, and shells, amongst other things. The items are decorated with paintings and the colors red, black, white, and yellow. They also involve the tribe's saying of honor the circle. 
While no formal decision has been made about the land, the site has remained untouched and the university has never interfered with the tribe's activities. Reporting for Campus Connection, I'm Nikki McVeigh. After the season they had last year, nobody would have predicted the kind of success the men's basketball team is currently having. They have a shot at the Big West Conference Championship and the NCAA Tournament. Aaron Huerta has more. From hard work by the players in the offseason and countless hours put in by the coaching staff recruiting, second year head coach Dan Munson believes they have found the right components for a successful program today and the future. It's just like building a house. It doesn't happen uh, in, in one day or, or even, even one year. You know, we're, we, we've got a good foundation right now, but if you look at a foundation of a house, it's just a bunch of cement and it's not a very pretty house. And, and that's where we are right now. We still got some building to do so that, so that five years from now, once you get that house built, it looks the same for years to come. After a tough preseason against powerhouse programs like Wisconsin, Syracuse, and Oregon, the Niners headed into conference play with a 5-7 and seven record and having many people wonder if this year was going to be a repeat of last year's. But Coach Munson did not panic and understood that a basketball season is a marathon and used his team's strengths to be successful in conference play and now making a run for the big dance. Well, I think our strength of our team is our depth. You know, we, we lose our best player, our leading scorer, and are still able to, to contend for a league championship. I think that tells you one thing, that, that it's not just based on one player. It's been a team uh, through and through. This team Coach Munson is referring to is a young squad and has a bright future ahead of them with three true freshmen playing significant minutes this year. But with March Madness play right around the corner, the team is focused on this year and is in contention for a regular season Big West Conference Championship, a two-round bye to start off the Big West Conference Tournament, and a spot in the NCAA Tournament. Play as a team. We're all, we're all, Donovan back, Torres is back, so our family's back together, so we're going to just dominate. Win the last four four games, uh, win the Big West, of course. Court side of the pyramid, I'm Aaron Huerta, reporting for Campus Connection. I hope they make the tournament. Yeah, we all do. Well, that ends this edition of Campus Connection. Be sure to join us again for our broadcast next time. Thanks for watching.